Hello and welcome to episode five of Reading the Victorian Novel, Charles Dickens's Great Expectations. In this installment, we will be talking about chapters 25 to 31, or weeks 19, 16 to 19. So in these, what we have in chapter 25, we go to Wenick's home, and that same week we have a juxtaposed chapter 26 with his Jagger's home. Then chapter seven, Joe comes to London. Chapter 28, Pip goes back to his village by stagecoach. And then chapters 30 and 31. In 30, we're at the village in Satis House. And in 31, we watch Wopsle play Hamlet. So we're going to start with Wemmick's house. And it's a, set up as a castle, a fortification. Wemmick's house was a little wooden cottage in the midst of plots of garden. And the top of it was cut out and painted like a battery mounted with guns. My own doing, said Wemmick. Looks pretty, don't it? I highly commended it. I think it was the smallest house I ever saw, with the queerest Gothic windows, by far the greater part of them sham, and a Gothic door almost too small to get in at. That's a real flagstaff, you see, said Wemmick. And on Sundays, I run up a real flag. Then look here, after I have crossed the bridge, I hoist it up, so, and cut off the communication. The bridge was a plank and it crossed a chasm about four feet wide and two deep. So what I want to point out here is that Wemmick lives in a world of fancy, but it's a world of defensive fancy. He's trying to hold out the external realm from this little slice of paradise and fancy that he has created of imagination for himself and his aged P, his aged parent. Um, and so that's how we have lines like cut out and painted like and then the windows being a sham. And notice, in the early chapters, Pip was the one that was an agent of fancy against the realism. But now, as he's come into his gentlemanly status, he's asserting the realism against Wemmick's fancy. So that's why Wemmick says a bridge and Pip says a plank. And he calls the windows out for being shams. The flags, though, are really interesting, right? Because Wemmick is playing at flags every Sunday, moving them up and down, which actually recalls back when Pip had the fancy. He said in chapter nine, when he's coming up with his lie about being at Satis House, we played with flags, I said. I beg to observe that I think of myself with amazement when I recall the lies I told on this occasion. Legs, echoed my sister. Yes said I. Estella waved a blue flag, and I waved a red one, and Miss Havisham waved one sprinkled all over with little gold stars out of the coach window. And then we all waved our swords and hurrahed. So in some ways, the fancy of the child Pip is manifesting in the reality of Wemmick's imagined castle. Um, also in Wemmick's house, we have another type of forgery. So you'll remember we have the kind of foraging that is at Joe's place, this idea of you take and craft something that you have to be a master at. But then we also have the forging that happens in London among the criminal class. The interval between that time and supper, Wemmick devoted to showing me his collection of curiosities. They were mostly of a felonious character, comprising the pen with which a celebrated forgery had been committed, a distinguished razor or two, some locks of hair, and several manuscript confessions written under condemnation, upon which Mr. Wemmick set particular value as being, to use his own words, every one of them lies, sir. These were agreeably dispersed among small specimens of china and glass, various neat trifles made by the proprietor of the museum, and some tobacco stoppers carved by the aged. So I'm interested first and all in this idea of the other type of forgery, right? But then also we have this kind of notion of collecting and of value. And this will connect in some ways to the increased presence of museum culture throughout the 19th century. So since the Renaissance, people had been engaged in creating what they called cabinets of curiosity. This culminates in a lot of ways with the Pitt Rivers Museum that you see here from Oxford, just a constant barrage, visual barrage of items that have been selected to be clumped together and displayed. And so the idea that Wemmick is a connoisseur of the criminal 
is really fascinating that he has this personal collection that he likes to show off. He is a curator in that way. So Wemmick's house gets immediately juxtaposed in the next chapter to Jaggers's. He took out his key and opened the door, and we all went into a stone hall, bare, gloomy, and little used. So, up a dark brown staircase into a series of three dark brown rooms on the first floor. There were carved garlands on the paneled walls, and as he stood among them giving us welcome, I know what kind of loops I thought they looked like. So notice all of these kind of monosyllabic, heavy words, stone, bare, dark brown room, like three dark brown rooms, right? Really kind of aggressive. Next to the barrage of like fanciness that we had at Wemmick's place, we have the reality here of Jaggers's. And notice these garlands, which should bring some levity, actually remind Pip of nooses. So when he says the kind of loops I thought they looked like, he's referring to the noose, the hangman's noose. We also deliberately juxtapose these two houses in terms of work and home. So at Wemmick, we had this quote. No, the office is one thing and private life is another. When I go into the office, I leave the castle behind me. And when I come into the castle, I leave the office behind me. If it's not in any way disagreeable to you, you'll oblige me by doing the same. I don't wish it professionally spoken about. So Wemmick creates this very sharp distinction between his realm of fancy and then he uh, which lets him clean off the Newgate cobwebs and his workplace. But with Jaggers, in a corner was a little table of papers with a shaded lamp, so that he seemed to bring the office home with him in that respect too, and to wheel it out of an evening and fall to work. So Jaggers' work and home are closely connected. Uh, another way that that's connected is where he washes his hands. He does the same hand washing in each location. Um, it's a really masterful kind of weekly installment of using these two different locations. And you'll also notice that um, Wemmick is allowed to talk about his realm in a way that maybe Jaggers is not so much. Um, and the prose style is very different as well. Uh, it's really worthwhile to spend some time appreciating these two chapters on your own. Um, so we now have a little bit of a glimpse into the retrospective pip. This is about the servant that Jaggers has. She sat on every dish, and I always saw in her face a face rising out of the cauldron. Years afterwards, I made a dreadful likeness of that woman by causing a face that had no other natural resemblance to it than it derived from flowing hair to pass beyond a bowl of flaming spirits in a dark room. Um, so... One, it points us to the fact that this is being written by an older Pip, um, retrospectively remembering these times. The other, though, is we're spending some time on this servant in a way that is odd. We've just finished comparing her to a witch from Macbeth and the witch's cauldron, and now Pip says he became a conjurer. So I'm going to use this to go on a little biographical interlude. Um, this quote comes from Mamie Dickens's My Father, as I recall him. At our holiday frolics, he used sometimes to conjure for us the equally noble art of the prestigitateur being among his accomplishments. And then later, but the best of it is that Forster, and this is uh, Dickens kind of talking, but the best of it is that Forster and I have purchased between us the entire stock and trade of a conjurer, the practice and display whereof is entrusted to me. And if you could see me conjuring the company's watches into impossible tea caddies and causing pieces of money to fly and burning pocket handkerchiefs without burning them, and practicing in my own room without anybody to admire, you would never forget it as long as you live. So um, I the, the elements that Dickens talks about are different from this conjuring that I have here in the passage, which is about making things up here out of steam, but it fits into the idea of Dickens the Conjurer. Um, this is an image that connects to a, a playbill that Dickens actually con um, created when he was on the Isle of Wight uh, and this is from Forster's Life. This is the, the notes. He made a playbill, and this is what he wrote about it, calling himself the person who I will say. The unparalleled necromancer, Rio Ramarus, educated cabalistically in the orange groves of Salamanca and the ocean caves of Alambay, 
some of whose proposed wonders it thus prefigures. The leaping card wonder! Two cards being drawn from the pack by two of the company and placed with the pack in the necromancer's box will leap forth at the command of any lady of not less than eight or more than 80 years of age. This wonder is the result of nine years of seclusion in the mines of Russia. Um, you'll notice something else we could talk about is the kind of intense Orientalism of this passage that he shrouds it in, right, from the alliterative name to the locations as well. Um, but this is just a little sense that uh, Pip, in some ways, enjoys entertainment in the same way that Dickens does. I'm not trying to say Dickens is Pip at all, but I just want to kind of emphasize or introduce you to some of the elements of the 19th century and Dickens' own life. Here are two really, really interesting illustrations by Kidd um, from the 1880s, courtesy of the Dickens Museum, showing Dickens the Great Magician, where he's actually conjuring out of the cauldron characters from his own novels. Let's now look at Biddy's letter at the beginning of chapter 27. It's a really remarkable piece of writing and letters are something that's worth thinking about in Great Expectations. So we looked at Pip's earlier letter, right? When he can't spell. And then there's a letter that kind of goes unreported. And now we start a chapter with this. My dear Mr. Pip, I write this by request of Mr. Gargery for to let you know that he is going to London in company with Mr. Wopsle and will be glad if agreeable to be allowed to see. He would call at Barnard's Hotel Tuesday morning at nine o'clock when, if not agreeable, please leave word. Your poor sister is much the same as when you left. We talk of you in the kitchen every night and wonder what you are saying and doing. If now considered in the light of the liberty, excuse it for the love of a poor old days. No more, dear Pip, from your ever obliged and affectionate servant, Biddy. P.S. He wishes me most particular to write, What larks? He says you will understand. I hope and do not doubt it will be agreeable to see him, even though a gentleman. For you had ever a good heart, and he is a worthy, worthy man. I have read him all, excepting only the last little sentence, and he wishes me most particularly to write again, What larks? So in this, um, what's nice about it is it's all polite on the surface, but it also shows a critique, right? Biddy is saying she's writing on behalf of somebody else, not on her own. And this triple repetition of, is it going to be agreeable? Is it not? Culminates in that conclusion when she says, I hope and do not doubt it will be agreeable, which is the implication of, hey, Pip, you got to see him. Don't try doing any fool tomfoolery. Um, we also learn implicitly that Pip has not been writing back. He has not been inquiring about her, his sister because Biddy has to say this to him, right? Much the same as when you left. That when you left tells us Pip has not made any inquiries. She calls herself a servant, making herself below the Mr. Pip. Um, notice though, too, by saying Mr. Pip, she's adhering to the rules of his inheritance, his expectations. Um, and then she plays with tense in a really interesting way, right? You had ever a good heart, reminding him of in the past. Maybe now he does not have one, right? Which we learned when he said he had come into the expectations and he accused Biddy of having a bad heart. Um, but Biddy emphasizes about Joe. Joe is consistent into the present, is a worthy, worthy man. That repetition of worthy also telling us what she thinks of him. So Joe comes. And we have what I think is one of the most cruel paragraphs in the novel, but it's easy to overlook. Presently, I heard Joe on the staircase. I knew it was Joe by his clumsy manner of coming upstairs, his state boots being always too big for him. And by the time it took him to read the names on the other floors in the course of his ascent. When at last he stopped outside my our door, I could hear his finger tracing over the painted letters of my name. And I afterwards distinctly heard him breathing in at the keyhole. Finally, he gave a faint single rap, and Pepper, such was the compromising name of the avenging boy, announced, Mr. Gargery! I thought he would never have done wiping his feet, and that I must have gone out to lift him off the mat. But at last, he came in. Joe! How are you, Joe? Pip! How are you? Pip. So, Pip could have gone out and helped Joe. That's the fundamental thing I want to emphasize about this passage. Instead, he stays inside and he listens to Joe struggle. Joe has a hard time reading, right? 
he has um, a hard time knowing where Pip is. Pip could facilitate all of this by running outside and saying, Joe, I'm right here. Come on. But instead, we get this passage of him detailing and judging Joe's struggles down to his stentorian breathing, even at the keyhole and his hesitation, right? All of these things have filled Joe with kind of uh, anxieties on his own. Uh, and then he comes in and is greeted. And here we get a wonderful bit. How air you, Joe, where the text, the, the all caps, the kind of the mispronunciation is Pip is putting on airs and Joe is kind of textually critiquing him. One of three of the most famous sentences in this book comes here. Joe writes a letter. Joe tells Pip he's going to not see him again. Pip, dear old chap. Life is made of ever so many partings welded together, as I may say. And one man's a blacksmith, and one's a whitesmith, and one's a goldsmith, and one's a coppersmith. Divisions among such must come and must be bet as they come. You won't find half so much fault in me if, supposing as you should ever wish to see me, you come and put your head in at the forge window and see Joe this blacksmith, there at the old anvil, in the old burnt apron, sticking to the old work. I'm awful dull, but I hope I've beat out something nigh the rights of this at last. And so God bless you, dear old Pip, old chap. God bless you. So this line, life is made of ever so many parties welded together, is a fundamentally important line. Like It's hard to emphasize, overemphasize it. So it operates in a number of ways. One, it's a metaphor that Joe comes up with because he uses welding, and that's blacksmith language. And you take a lot of parts, you weld them together, and you create a new hole. It creates a chain. You can think of it that way. Um, and it doesn't matter the material, right? Blacksmith or goldsmith or coppersmith. But people have to be divided eventually. And that's the way life is, right? You're probably not friends with your kindergarten friends, but they were fundamental for who you are and who you're going to become. The other thing that this is a reference to, in addition to that idea of a metaphor from blacksmithing or an idea of separation, is the weekly installments of reading Great Expectations. The text itself is made of ever so many parts, weekly parts, that have been put together and will create a whole. So in that way, it is what's called metatextual. That is literature about literature. It's a statement about how do we read. And then in the second paragraph, we get something really nice about approaching a thing on its own terms and in its own context, right? Joe the blacksmith in that place. And notice this repetition of old anvil, old apron, old work, and then calling Pip old chap. When those things all go together, the world works. Um, this idea as well, a last kind of blacksmithing metaphor, I beat out something now the rights of this, right? like banging it out with the hammer on the end. So it's really kind of a, an amazing line, just devastating its sublimity. Uh, so a literary term is chiasmus. Uh, I wanted to say something about chapter 28, which is Pip is in the stagecoach heading back to the village. Uh, and what I will introduce is chiasmus. Chiasmus is an ABBA structure, usually of adjective noun, noun adjective, but we have a really elaborate one in this phrase describing the marshes. Mud bank, mist, swamp, and work. Work, swamp, mist, and mud bank. So you'll see here, I've tried to use letters to indicate that we have an A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. Um, so what chiasmus does is it creates an X, literally from the, the Greek key, which is the X shape, and it creates a, a locked-in system. And so in this way, we might think that when you are in the village, you're kind of locked or you're stuck, you can't escape. We also have some interesting things happening with alliteration on the, the outside mudbank mist. Notice we also have the disyllabic mudbank, and then we go to the monosyllabic mist swap and work. So it's really just... Uh, interesting stylistically and to think about this convict speaking this way. 
while we're here, we have a little pun. Pip, uh, we end the chapter. I entertain a conviction based upon my large experience that if in the days of my prosperity, I had gone to the North Pole, I should have met somebody there wandering Eskimos or a civilized man who would have told me that Pumblechuk was my earliest patron and the founder of my fortunes. So entertaining a conviction after a chapter with a convict is a fun little playful bit. This discussion of the North Pole is really rooted in the 19th century obsession with polar exploration and the attempt to find the Northwest Passage and cannibalism. So the Northwest Pole for the Victorian was a place of imagination of the sublime and of fear of desolation and of economic hope. It was kind of their moonshot or Mars habitation. In 1845, you had the Franklin Expedition, which consumed entirely the British imagination, especially when people discovered that there was a possibility that they had in, entered into cannibalism. And Dickens actually wrote a series of letters arguing against it, saying like the spirit of the Britain would never allow them to do so. In 1856, um, a few years before, four years before writing Great Expectations, he and Wilkie Collins had written a play set in um, polar exploration called The Frozen Deep. So it's really just part of his imagination and the landscape. Uh, this is a picture that is from 1947, so not at all related, but it's one of my favorite pictures. It's Peter Freuken, who is a polar explorer, and his wife, Damar, and I just think it's a phenomenal illustration with him in his pursuit and her and her elegance. Um, when Pip returns to Status House, in chapter 29, he begins with several long speeches on love, some of which are uh, quite beautiful. But one of the things he says about his love is, I mention this in this place of a fixed purpose because it's the clue by which I am to be followed into my poor labyrinth. So this is a classical allusion, meaning an allusion to classical myth to Theseus and the Minotaur and Ariadne. So in that myth, and I'm going to just briefly summarize it, Pasiphae was the queen of Crete. She was married to Minos. She fell in love with a white bull and she wanted to have sex with it. So she contacted Daedalus. Daedalus said, yeah, I can make this happen. Built her a contraption. She put her body in. The bull had sex with her. She gave birth to a minotaur because of genetics, uh, which was a creature with hooves, a tail, a bull head, and then the body of a man. Minos couldn't kill it because he thought that that would be bad. And so he told Daedalus, I need a way to keep this thing away. Daedalus built a labyrinth, this huge maze. And then every few years, the Cretans made the Athenians send them humans to sacrifice. Tired of this practice, Theseus, an Athenian, went to Crete to end it. And he needed help. Ariadne, the Cretan princess, said, hey, I'm in love with you. Here is a string. I'll hold one end. You can walk through and it'll unspool. And that way you can find your way back and survive. So that thread or that spool is a clue. And so here I'm going to read from Etymology Online. A clue is anything that guides or directs in an intricate case. It's a revised spelling of C-L-E-W, which is a ball of thread or yarn. So Dickens is actually combining these things of clues and labyrinths on top, so it's like detective fiction meets uh, the labyrinth. And so we can ask ourselves, what is the labyrinth? Well, this myth is about illicit love, but the labyrinth kind of is connected to London itself. Uh, so who is the monster at the center of it? All of these are questions that get activated by using this illusion. In chapter 30, we deal with Pips as a now gentleman response to the lower classes, and he gets others fired like a loser. So Orlick has been moving up at the world. He's no longer at the forge. He now has a comfortable job as the um, gatekeeper, the porter at Status House. Pip doesn't like this, and so I resolved to tell my guardian that I doubted Orlick's being the right sort of man to fill a post of trust at Miss Havisham's, with the result that, very good, Pip. He observed when I had concluded, I'll go around presently and pay our friend off. So chapter 30 opens, Pip gets Orlick fired. Then we have what is probably the funniest moment in this book, which is Trab's boy running around like mocking Pip, 
He's doppelganging him really, really hard. It's unheimlich, to use another Freudian term. Um, this recurring presence. Don't know yet. Don't know yet. It's it's absolutely fantastic. But Pip responds. I wrote, however, to Mr. Trab by next day's post to say that Mr. Pip must decline to deal further with one who could so far forget what he owed to the best interests of society as to employ a boy who excited loathing in every respectable mind. So really, Pip is entering into a state of extreme unlikability here, but it's tempered with his interactions with Herbert, which are funny and playful and full of uh, exuberance for friendship. So it's really a delicate balancing act that Dickens is engaged in right now. Uh, so we're going to wrap up with chapter 31, this fantastic, this performance, this comical performance of Hamlet that Pip and Herbert go to. Afterward, Wopsle kind of invites himself out then. So Pip, I invited him and he went to Barnard's with us, wrapped up in the eyes. And we did our best for him. And he sat until two o'clock in the morning, reviewing his success and developing his plans. I forget in detail what they were, but I've got a general recollection that he was to begin with reviving the drama and to end with crushing it, inasmuch as his decease would leave it utterly bereft and without a chance or hope. Um, so what I think this is doing, there's a lot to be said about the role of the theater. We've talked about stages in the past, um, but I just want to simply say here, Pip is encountering somebody else within delusions of expectations. And we can ask ourselves, is Wopsall another way of seeing Pip and his own expectations in London? Both of them have, after all, come there recently to pursue a dream. And with that, I bid you farewell.